Good evening from the state of Kuwait. Welcome to the 7 o'clock news for Friday, the 3rd of October 2014. I am Dalia Badran with the headlines for tonight. Pilgrims head to Mount Arafah on the day of Grand Pilgrimage, the second day of Hajj rituals. Heavy clashes are reported as the IS militants advance on the Syrian town of Ain al-Arab as Turkey vows to help prevent it from falling. Britain's Prime Minister pledges support for Afghanistan's newly sworn-in president and the country's government. Pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong threaten to call off talks with the government unless Attacks against their supporters cease. Hello and welcome. Pilgrims started today the 9th of the Hajjah after sunrise heading to Mount Arafah for what is known as the Grand Pilgrimage. The pilgrims spent last night in Mina after they spent the day there following the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Head of the Ministry of Awqaf and Islamic Affairs Delegation, Rumi Rumi, said the movement of Kuwaiti pilgrims to Mina was smooth and safe, adding that camps for Kuwaiti pilgrims are set both in Mina and Arafah. His Highness the Emir, Sheikh Sabah al-Ahmad al-Jabar al-Sabah, sent a cable of congratulations to His Excellency, President of the Federal Republic of Germany, Joachim Gok, on the occasion of his country's National Day. His Highness the Crown Prince, Sheikh Nawaf al-Ahmad al-Jabar al-Sabah, sent a cable of congratulations to His Excellency, President of the Federal Republic of Germany, Joachim Gok, on the occasion of his country's national day. His Highness Sheikh Jabir Mubarak al Hamad al-Sabah, the Prime Minister, also sent a similar cable of congratulations. Heavy fighting is being reported between Kurdish militiamen and Islamic State militants advancing on the northern Syrian town of Ain al-Arab. The IS has moved to within a few kilometers of the town despite U.S.-led airstrikes seeking to halt its two-week offensive. Reports said the IS today reached the outskirts of Ain al-Arab. On Thursday, Turkey's prime minister promised it would do whatever it could to prevent the fall of Ain al-Arab. Ahmad Davutolgo spoke only hours after the Turkish parliament authorized military operations against militants in Iraq and Syria who threatened Turkey's security and for foreign troops to use Turkish bases. More than 160,000 Syrians, mainly Kurds, have fled across the border since the IS launched an offensive to capture the town on the 15th of September. Australia's Prime Minister said today that the nation's air force will launch airstrikes against the IS targets in Iraq. Tony Abbott uh, said the cabinet has authorized Australian airstrikes in Iraq at the request of the Iraqi government. Six Australian F-A-18 Super Hornet jet fighters were pre-deployed to the United Arab Emirates more than two weeks ago. Two unarmed Australian Air Force planes joined operations over Iraq for the first time on Wednesday in support roles. The Australian deployment also includes a 200-strong ground force, including special forces to advise security forces inside Iraq, plus 400 Air Force personnel. Iran said today that a high-level UN nuclear watchdog team will visit Tehran for talks in the coming days more than a month after it missed the deadline for addressing questions about its suspected nuclear program. Diplomats said the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, was expected to make a new attempt soon to advance its long-running investigation into Iran's nuclear program. They added that the meeting might be held in the Iranian capital early next week. 
رضا النجفي ايران's ambassador to the Vienna based UN agency said the IAEA delegation would be led by the head of its division dealing with nuclear safeguards issues The Israeli army imposed a closure on all West Bank areas, banning Palestinians of moving freely between West Bank cities and towns isolating Jerusalem. Fatima Abdul Karim has more from Ramallah. The Israeli government imposed a security closure over the West Bank for four consecutive days, starting last night and lasting over the days of Al Adha Eid. Israel said. The closure comes because of the Jewish holidays. The closure bans Palestinians from movement throughout the West Bank from one city to another and includes the only border crossing connecting the West Bank to the world. This is a political measure and it comes to show that all the geographical classifications of the land, whether A, B or C, are under the control of the occupation. Second, Israel wants to impose a new security threat over the lives of Palestinians and make them suffer. Palestinians warn that this step and the imposed movement restrictions will be used to isolate Jerusalem throughout the days of Al-Adha Eid, which coincides with the Jewish Yom Kippur, in which fundamental settlers raid the yards of Al-Aqsa Mosque. The occupation wanted invasions to be made easy for settlers ahead of Arafah Day and the first day of Eid, which coincides with the Jewish Yom Kippur. So the occupation authorities aim to protect the rights of settlers but violate the rights of Muslims. Based on international law, the movement restrictions of Palestinians and banning them from practicing their religious rights is a clear violation of basic human rights and international humanitarian law. Israel deploys its army throughout the West Bank and sets up its checkpoints in between Palestinian cities right on the days of Al Eid holiday and the end of Hajj just to show that it's here to protect the settlers and serve them while it humiliates Palestinians. Fatma Abdul Karim, Kuwait TV, Ramallah, Palestine. Thank you, Fatma. Britain's Prime Minister David Cameron pledged support today for Afghanistan's newly sworn-in president and the country's new unity government. During a surprise visit to Kabul, Cameron said that Britain is committed to helping Afghans build a more secure and prosperous future. The British Prime Minister was the first world leader to meet Ashraf Ghani, Afghan's second elected president since his inauguration on Monday. The two had a meeting in Kabul today and later held a joint press conference. Cameron insisted there was no prospect of the UK going back to fight in Afghanistan. Camp Bastion and in just three months all British combat troops will be home. That meets the commitment that I made in July 2010 that we would bring our combat troops home by the end of this year. But let me be clear, we will continue to support the development of the Afghan forces through our leading role at the Afghan National Officer Academy here in Kabul. First to you. Pakistan's military today said it killed 15 insurgents in air strikes in a tribal district near the Afghan border, a region where it has been battling militants for more than a decade. The military said three terrorist hideouts were destroyed and 15 terrorists were killed in effective and precise aerial strikes today in the Khyber region. Khyber is one of Pakistan's seven semi-autonomous regions governed by tribal laws and lies near the Afghan border. The Taliban and other Al-Qaeda-linked groups who staged attacks in both countries are known to have strongholds in the zone. 
Leaders of pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong today threatened to call off talks with the government after demonstrators were involved in scuffles with angry opponents. They said the government must prevent organized attacks on supporters of the occupied movement. The protesters angry at China's plan to vet election candidates have been occupying parts of the city. They had earlier accepted an offer of talks from Hong Kong's chief executive. The protests led to government offices in the main protest hit area being closed, the authorities urging staff to work from home because roads were blocked. The International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, today condemned the indiscriminate shelling in East Ukraine after a Red Cross employee was killed in Dantesk. An ICRC worker died yesterday when a shell landed near the organization's offices in the rebel-held city of Dantesk. The ICRC director of operations said the in the worker was one of several casualties in the city. The rebels and the government blamed each other for the shelling. Reports said other mortar shells landed in central Donsk today. Liberian authorities have announced plans to prosecute Ebola victim who carried the virus into the United States, accusing him of lying about not having any contact with an infected person. U.S. health officials said up to 100 people are being monitored in Texas for potential exposure to Ebola. Meanwhile, a Ugandan doctor suffering from Ebola has arrived today in Frankfurt for treatment in the city's university hospital. German health minister said the doctor worked for an Italian non-governmental organization in Sierra Leone. The Ugandan doctor is the second medical worker with the Ebola to be treated in Germany. And finally tonight, Ambassador of the Republic of Korea in Kuwait, His Excellency Shin Bonnam, congratulated his fellow community members on the occasion of Korea's Independence Day and gave special praise and focus to the strong ties between Kuwait and Korea. His Excellency reiterated that ever since Korea dispatched troops to Kuwait in 1991 to help safeguard the country during the Iraqi invasion, the two nations, the two nations have sustained a steadfast and mutually beneficial partnership in all areas of both bilateral and multilateral relations. But Riyal Saleh has more in this report. October 1st not only welcomes in the start of fall, but also hosts South Korea's Independence Day. In Kuwait, many members of the local South Korean community, as well as other member communities gathered at the Regency Hotel, to wish His Excellency the Ambassador congratulations on his country's National Day. I'm glad to participate with our friends uh, in this National uh, Day. Uh, Korea means a lot of things for Kuwait. We enjoying an excellent relations with uh, Korea and uh, we have our cooperation in many fields uh, in the constructions and in the energy investment trade and we always looking forward really to enhance our contacts our cooperation with with korea especially when uh, we always remember the uh, strong stand uh, which we uh, received from them uh, during the difficult days uh, which we passed uh, during the invasion. Uh, we remember this strong stand from Korea to support Kuwait and to stand beside Kuwait. So uh, we wish uh, all the best the Korean people and the Korean government and looking forward really to see our relationship with them always strong and strong. 
His Excellency praised the relationship between the two countries as well as celebrating and congratulating his fellow community members on their national day. Kuwait is the second largest crude oil supplier and third biggest construction market to Korea. Since the 70s and 80s, many Korean companies have participated in major infrastructure projects, thus contributing to the economic development in Kuwait, thus showing the strong bilateral and relational ties between the two countries. This is our National Day reception and we actually congratulate. Uh, this year is actually the, the we celebrate 35th diplomatic relations and before that we have uh, some trade relations about 10 years. So our relation between two countries almost 50 years, half a century. These days uh, we have uh, we are uh, witnessing kind of the the para paradigm shift of our economic relations. So far we are concentrate the trade and the constructions, but now we are see the new possibility of the construction of a new town and the and the high speed railroad systems cooperation, and also we have uh, renewable energies and uh, what else? Uh, oh, medical service now. Already other GCC countries, including Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, uh, several thousand patients coming over to Korea for the, treat for the medical treatment in our uh, very sophisticated hospitals. Now we are talking with uh, your government about uh, the Kuwait patients uh, for the treatment in Korea. Ever since the establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries in 1979, Korea and Kuwait have been expanding their relationship in many fields, like military and security, society, culture and education, just to name a few. Tonight, the ambassador and his guests not only celebrated South Korea's National Day, but they also praised and celebrated a strong, almost 50-year-long relationship between Kuwait and South Korea. At the Regency Hotel, I'm Badria Saleh, reporting for The English News. Andrea, for a chance to see our reports again, please visit our YouTube channel at MOI Kuwait News. Before we end here is a quick reminder of today's headlines. Pilgrims head to Mount Arafah on the day of Grand Pilgrimage, the second day of Hajj rituals. Heavy clashes are reported as the IS militants advance on the Syrian town of Ain al-Arab as Turkey vows to help to prevent it from falling. Britain's Prime Minister pledges support for Afghanistan's newly sworn-in president and the country's government. Pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong threaten to call off talks with the government unless attacks against their supporters cease.